It is an absolute joy always for me to connect with Kelly Hunter, um, incredible astrologer, mythologist, Dr. Kelly Hunter. Um, it was, as I've mentioned before, it was, it was Kelly's presentation on the Kuiper Belt objects and the dwarf planets, I think around three years ago, Kelly. 2020. I, mm -hmm. Yeah, 2020 that I heard and was absolutely electrified. And I've been doing my own digging into these and I still feel like it, I've you got sure have. <laughs> but, but it, Kelly was one of the very, very earliest researchers into this next octave of consciousness. And and these these archetypes are so fascinating for where we're headed. They can teach us so much about new earth and our evolution of consciousness. So we always have wonderful, wonderful discussions. And we're going to be in this session talking about all things watery. So mm -hmm. because there's so much water around with Salassia, Sedna, Saturn has just moved into Pisces. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Kelly, to, to start to take off the discussion that we're going to have today. OK, well, we just had Saturn go into Pisces and I don't, I'm feeling it already. I am just having such trouble keeping myself organized. So got to <laughs> rein it in, got to get our, our little boat, you know, together <laughs> and row. So um, yeah, but it is uh, really uh, an incredible energy and, and opportunity to become, you know, experienced in, in water energy more, you know, and if we're going to take just the like a, a one word key word for Saturn and Pisces, we could actually say structured water, which has become a topic of great interest. And um, so so that is a strong thing. And, and I started to look forward to like, you know, when does uh, Saturn conjunct Neptune? And it almost conjuncts Neptune in Pisces, but not quite within a degree or even half a degree, but they don't conjunct until February of 2026 at zero plus Aries, yeah. Yeah. which is a very activated degree lately. So that's kind of interesting. And I was also, we're going to talk about Celasia quite a bit today. And uh, she is the, the consort, the co-ruler with Neptune. So I was looking at, well, when does Saturn get to Celasia? And that's also not until 2026 um, into 2027. And that's going to be um, in the mid degrees. And then I had to look at when Celasia conjuncts Neptune. And, you know, they have a different orbits what is it, uh, 165 years for Neptune and 300 and is it 271 for Celestia? So they don't meet up very often. You know, she's very elusive. <laughs> she was right from the beginning of their courtship and they don't meet up. They get really close in 2031, but they don't meet up until uh, they have a kind of long interlude from 2035 to 2038 in the in Aries from 23 to 28 degrees. So I just thought those little factoids were kind of interesting, you know, with with these uh, different energies that we're, we're going to be looking at today and the the dance that all of these, you know, things uh, do together, which is why we so love astrology and that the choreography has gotten so complex lately, so extraordinary, awesome. And certainly the Kuiper Belt objects add into that. Yeah, beautiful. And, and you know, it, it's so interesting that this is such a big period of endings and beginnings as well, isn't it, Kelly? There's so many planets, mm. Kuiper Belt objects at right at the very end of their sign, 29 degrees like Sedna or, or Pluto. Um, and, 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 and also at the very beginning, like Homer just tipping into Scorpio in, in November, so last November. So it's such a, a, a pivotal period, I feel. And yeah, yeah. Water, water energy is very much emphasized. And I think the next few years, particularly with so many planets shifting signs, the, you know, the outer planets of Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, all in the next three years shifting sign, plus 
several of the Kuiper Belt objects too. So boy, are we going to go through some big transitions. But I think our understanding of water, and as you say, structured water, and that's such a literal translation of the symbolism of Saturn in Pisces, um, we are going to learn so much about what that means for our health, for our consciousness. And I know you've been digging into this and so have I. And, you know, I, I think we almost invite the audience on this detective story with us because we've got so much more to learn in the coming years. You know, I don't uh, know. I know everything by a thousand miles about this, but yeah, I'm sure I'll learn a lot from you in this in this conversation. Well, from each other, because you got me going on the uh, Salacia and the salt in her name, S-A-L, is salt. And you mentioned that on one of your videos not long ago, and I picked up on it and I said, yes, yes. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I've been looking into salt um, for a variety of reasons, but certainly because it's her name and I love the sea. So, um, so Sedna, I mean, uh, Sedna's in the sea too. She's at the bottom of the sea and Selassie is more on the surface of the sea in the sense that, you know, she makes the sunlight to sparkle on the sea. And it goes a lot more deep than that when we add in the salt. So I, um, I have some slides to share. Are we ready to do that now? Yeah, lovely. Yeah. Okay. Let me see if I can do that. <laughs> um, okay. Okay, so, okay, we good? Yep, yeah, wonderful. See it very clearly, thank you. Okay, um, so uh, this is Salacia. This is, um, you know, part of my research involves uh, creative art. And I was doing a lot of uh, drawings and uh, made a coloring book for the Kuiper Belt objects because this is my way of getting involved with them and exploring their imagery. So this is one of my, my um, not too long ago, uh, quick <laughs> sketches of Selassia um, translating the sunlight onto the sea like stars. And uh, this is a quote I found recently. Actually, it was in this booklet I've been reading by Veda Austin, who you have mentioned, who's doing this extraordinary study of water through deep microscopic almost um, photography. And she quotes Pythagoras saying, salt is born of the purest parents, the sun and the sea. Wow. So I, I just love that. <laughs> And the sea is incorrect, you know, the sea is salty. And we have so much salt water in us too. Uh, yeah, Veda Austin, she calls us uh, our blood, our own private ocean. <laughs> so I wow. love that. And, and she comes, she writes that, you know, the blood in our bodies, our, our ocean, in fact, is the, um, the one substance that uh, uh, engages and touches into every part of our body. And isn't it interesting, Kelly? I, in a recent video, I talked about this, this Frenchman called René Quinton, who died in the early 1900s. And what he was doing was he found a way to purify seawater and inject it into people who were very ill and they regained their health. And it's still sold in Europe as Quinton water. It's marine plasma because the, oh. the salt water plasma is so very close to our blood plasma. And isn't it interesting that, that if there's salt in water, it can take an electrical charge and it becomes yes. a liquid crystal. Without the salt, it's not a crystal. With the salt, it becomes a crystal. Yes, and salt can grow like a crystal. Yeah. And um, so I, I'm really sharing a lot of what I've learned from uh, Veda Austin's little booklet called The Marriage of Salt and Water which I love because, you know, Selassie married Neptune. So there we are with their marriage. Um, and so part of what she says is that, um, uh, mm, she gives a formula for um, sole, S-O-L-E, that comes from the word for sun, soul, but it's um, water that's, saturated with salt and you can make this you can 
put like a quarter jar of salt in and then uh, cover it with water, especially if you have salt crystals, that's really good. And and I, I got to share with you, I have some some salt crystals from um, where I go in the Caribbean. This is St. John's oh, wow. salt. Yeah, wow, beautiful. Gosh, they're big. And down there, we we swim in the, these salt ponds, they're called. And at certain times of year, when they, it's dry enough, the salt ends up on the surface of the the, the pond. But we can go swimming in them for a very intensified salt water sort of bath. And there's it's it's like a fabulous experience, especially under the moonlight. Wow. And isn't it interesting? Gosh, that's absolutely wonderful. Because the, the Dead Sea is very a very high concentration of salt, isn't it? And somebody sent me this just yesterday, Kelly. It's so interesting about Selassia and this whole salt thing. Um, and I'm going to quote from what she sent. And she, uh, oh, this is from a book called The Dead Sea by James Tiberon, the Earth Keeper. And he says, uh, with extremely low elevation, the sunlight that bathes the Dead Sea, which has very high salt in it, is particularly potent yet benevolent as the harmful rays are filtered by the plasma that floats on top of the salt lake. Oh, whoa. And, you know, it's the, it's the surface of the water that we talk about with Selassia, isn't it? The, that shimmering sunlight and moonlight on the surface. And he, James Tiberon here, is talking about it's filtering the plasma and therefore making everything very benevolent in that, in that Dead Sea and very healing. So there's something around this. And one of the earliest theories of evolution was that earliest life formed with the, the repeated movement of the tides on the tide edge on beaches, oh, no. because it can provide oh. an electrical charge to the salt and you know very primitive forms of life began there. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but it, it, it comes back to everything we're talking about here. Well, a lot of the salt crystals are like ancient, you know, because it's like the pressure of whatever you know, that they're under for a really long time makes them very, um, uh, the crystalline cubic, you know, kind of shape of some of the salt. We've got the Salt Lake in in Utah. Of course. You know, we have, so people get salt from that. You know, Salt Lake City is famous, but it has a, a lot of salt that's another kind of pure salt. You know, you certainly don't want table salt that is, you know, processed with, you know, stuff you really don't want, which is probably given salt its bad name, you know, in terms of like high blood pressure people and, you know, various things. So, you know, we we need the the really fine salt. There's the, the Celtic salt that's gray. There's the Himalayan salt that's pink. Although I don't know if that's over commercialized at this point, but we want to be as careful about our salt as we are about our water. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the sole, um, uh, when you saturate the water with it and you um, put it in a jar and shake it and then leave it overnight, it does something to the water, uh, which makes it into a very concentrated uh, salt content that, uh, as you were saying, activates the water and with like a kind of electricity because when you put salt in water it's twice as many negative ions as positive and i re i've heard about negative ions for years which is why you want to be near the water you know that kind of thing and so you're getting that and you only need like a a, a teaspoon in a glass of water and you're activating in your body um, the whole salt arrangement that and the adrenals need salt to do their thing, which has to do with hormones, but also in regards to this discussion, it it has it keeps the balance between potassium that's inside your cells and sodium that's outside your cells. And that is like a primary, you know, two primary um. Uh, minerals that you need in your body so you don't die you know you can die from lack of salt <laughs> so yeah, absolutely yeah. not 
I understand that, you know, if you have sufficient salt, then you have a good electrical charge in the body because it stimulates the mitochondria, which are little batteries. And, mm. and, and the healthier your electrical charge, the healthier the body. So yeah. there's a very close connection here between salt and, and health in the body. It's, yeah. As you're saying, it's fascinating. Yeah, it's true for animals too. You know, they, they, they lose their something or their vitality. And, and um, I just was reading about this because a friend of mine, her cat has a lot of fleas. And I was looking at um, Green Hope Farm has all these animal wellness essences, flower essences. And there's one called flea free. And the point of that combination is to um, activate the electrical body. And so if animals don't have like enough electrical, you know, activity in their body, they get fleas and they get other illnesses. And in humans, you know, our, our kidneys, if, if they're too stressed out, the adrenals are too stressed out, we get dehydrated. So we need water that helps, uh, the salt helps um, minerals be absorbed into the body. So um, yeah, this is where I'm get I get a little shaky because I've got to reread some of this material to like really get it. Um, but it also reminded me of um, one of my very first interests when I started studying astrology was cell salts, the tissue salts that <clears throat> were developed by Dr. Wilhelm Schussler. So people know them as Schussler cell salts, and there are twelve of them. People have associated them with different signs of the zodiac. And um, so they, they are combinations of like basic um, minerals, like the uh, potassium, magnesium, there's several sulfate combinations, calcium, and the one called sodium chloride. And there's more, uh, that's salt, that's salt. So there's one that's actually salt. And what this, um, this cell salt does, it helps regulate the salt in your body, and then it has, uh, you know, other symptoms that it can help alleviate. So um, wow. that's and very interesting. And that one is associated with the sign of Aquarius. Oh, how interesting is that? And, and, and going back to the point you were making earlier about cell and, 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 and sal, it's, um, as well as being salt, it's also the fact that in um, olden times, because salt was recognized as being so precious mm. for your health, um, you were paid in salt. That's where the oh. word salary, salary came oh, wow, from. Oh, that's great. You are paid in salt. So yes. it really is a precious commodity, which I think has been vilified over the years, as you've said. Oh. And they're those kind of people called salt of the earth, where you can yeah. really depend on those people. <laughs> So let's uh, keep going on the slides, um, if I can. Uh-oh, there we go. So um, here's just a, a combination of things and information about Selassia, who is the saltwater mermaid of the calm and sunlit sea and ocean depths, causes the sunlight to sparkle on the sea, married to Neptune, is what it says in the... Um, uh, jet laboratory, jet propulsion laboratory site you can get online that gives all of these facts and information about the name and the discovery date and everything like that for all the um, the small bodies in the solar system, including moons and the Kuiper Belt object and asteroids. Great resource. So um, you know all of these Kuiper Belt objects were basically discovered in this new millennium. So they're very new. And they represent this different level of consciousness, even beyond, you know, the, the outer planets. And Pluto is one of the, the right on the front edge. I call Pluto the king of the Kuiper belt. So this is, um, you know, if you need to know where your Selassie is, there, there's a little listing here. So, um, and some art, so many people are, are uh, artists are really engaged with, with Selassie and the mermaids. <laughs> um, it's so, beautiful, isn't it? And I, I think I think of Selassie, and I, I, I think you agree with this, Kelly, that um, she seems to be linked to the photonic light because she, that sparkling on the water is that very high frequency sort of yes. dark white light. 
And with being mermaid energy, and I just picked this up yesterday from this lady called Judith Cusell, K-U-S-E-L, and she channels. And thinking of Selassie as mermaid energy, she says that the mer people came from Sirius together with the whales and the dolphins. Oh. Oh. And they live underwater and cleanse the ocean. Um, oh. and the mer people sing to the sea creatures and because sound creates light in the water, they're helping to bring in a new high frequency um, oh. kind of water of new earth. And oh. what that means, she said, will not only extinct sea creatures reappear, but completely new oh. sea creatures will appear. Oh, that's so exciting. Yeah, I was told by a Welsh psychic that I was from a planet that orbits Sirius B, the smaller planet in that system, and that it was a, a fluid plasma planet. So one could, you know, be in the air or in the water without any breathing <laughs> problems. And I so related to that. So uh, so yeah, my mermaid is uh, very happy to hear all that. And I love that the sound frequency creates light because in some traditions, they talk about the sound and light being the, the vibration, the frequency that is, you know, started the whole creation. Wow. So the sound and light go together. And there's some meditation uh, forms that use uh, use that to listen to the sound of the source energy that leads the soul back to our you know, spiritual home. Wow, and in a, in a very recent interview just a few days ago with Vader Austin, I heard her talk about how structured water contains light. Oh, yeah. So we're back to this, wow. you know, I'm kind of, <laughs> I'm just on a detective story here, but there's some kind of link between the sound, the structure, and the amount of light, perhaps, that we have in water that is, as Veda says, a living consciousness that we are ingesting. Well, in her, you know, more about the sole, the S-O-L-E, she actually says that the high salt content makes it, and, and the, the salt actually holds sunlight in it. And so when it's dissolved in water and releases the, the ions that electrify the water, um, it becomes a, a, a kind of um, liquid sunlight, fluid sunlight, fluid light. She used all those terms and you have been as well. Wow. <laughs> I, I think we're on the brink of something very big and important with this, do you feel? Oh, yes, it's so exciting. And we are getting these huge waves and let's call them fluid light, you know, so the water, very interesting. So, you know, Selassie's name that means salty. And when we pronounce it Salacia, which my people would have the tendency to do because of that word salacious, which has negative connotations, but basically means arousing or appealing to sexual desire or imagination. You know, that this is, um, you know, kind of an erotic energy. Eros emerge from chaos with Gaia, with the power of desire to create earth. And, you know, now that Haumea is in Scorpio, I think we're getting another deep dive into that desire power. Um, and she has so much to do with deep emotional questioning, even in her, her uh, courtship by Neptune. And uh, she has that, uh, you can't see salt in the water, except if it, you know, evapor the water evaporates or, but you can taste it, you can feel it, you can experience it. And, um, you know, mermaids are inherently, you know, really uh, sensual and, Let's uh, let's let's celebrate that aspect of, of our lives. Um, and she had a, a you know how they give um, different um, uh, things to like Jupiter or the different planets have different attributes. Selassia Neptuni means the effervescence of Neptune. And we see that when the phosphorescence uh, comes and the, there's uh, this like light in the water. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I once went, um, I was on a boat at night waiting for the fireworks to, to happen. And we were going in the water and coming up the ladder. And one of my friends has this long blonde mermaid hair. And she came up the, the boat's ladder out of the water and this phosphorescence was dripping from her hair. I will never forget that. Beautiful. So, um, yeah, so there's there's uh, Selassia. Um, wow. So these are pictures I took when I, wow. you know, when I'm in the Virgin Islands. And this... Um, the glitter path, when the sunlight is making, is lower in the sky and making a path across the water. And the moonlight does that too. And I've seen this glitter path made by Venus, very low in the sky and by Sirius. Stunning. So, yeah. So, you know, the, the Dogon people in Mali have this long tradition of these fish people <laughs> coming to them from Sirius. And they a lot of their wisdom comes from those people and it's in their history. These this encounters with these um, you know, ocean dwelling beings that were part fish and part human. Wow. So the glitter path, this comes from a talk I heard by one of the students at um the Sophia Center for the Study of Cosmology and Culture. Um, they do amazing work. And she's from Crete. And she did her study on how many Cretan tombs have a door to the east to allow the, the glitter path when the sun comes up to mm -hmm. make a walkway across the water so you can walk across the water and rise into the sky and the sun. Beautiful. So, yeah, so it's just, uh, so there it is. And, um, you know, when I first got down to the Virgin Islands and this turquoise sea is just amazing. Like people would sit at the beach and read like they do, you know, and it's like, how can they do that? Look at the sun glittering on the ski. It's it's a message. It's telling us something. Let's read that, you know, so I uh, just loved that whole thing. Now, here's a photo somebody sent me recently. It's not of the sea. It's of a pool of water. Mm -hmm. uh, and he caught it at just the right time. So that's, I, you know, that's almost like you can see the salt dissolving in the water there, you know, and creating the frequency. And, and isn't, it, isn't it interesting, Kelly, that Selassia was discovered round about the time that we were just about to enter the, the, the photon belt in space with this very high oh, frequency white light. There, was, oh, a, there really? was a link in time. Yeah. And I think that's really interesting as well. Oh, that's beautiful. Capturing, yes. light, capturing light in the water. Um, oh, stunning. Water. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I've gotten into putting a little bit of that sole, just a few drops in almost all the water that I'm drinking. Um, because I'm having problems with really dry skin. <laughs> so I'm really looking forward. I'm about to go back to the, the, the Caribbean and I am so looking forward. Somebody was wearing a t-shirt last year down there that said, salt water cures everything. <laughs> I think that so, could be true. I mean, looking at Rene Quinton's work, he he's yes. incredibly successful. Yes. yes. So it's nice to be immersed in that energy too. Um, so there's somebody sent me um, this a link to a song by Bruce Cockburn, uh, Nate called "All the Diamonds in the World," and and it's a beautiful song. I would sing it if I hadn't sort of partly lost my voice today. Um, but he goes, all the diamonds in this world that mean anything to me are conjured up by wind and sunlight sparkling on the sea. He's a Canadian uh, songwriter and singer, um, uh, classic Canadian. He's been around for decades. And this is on an album called Sun, Salt and Time. So I, you know, I had to share that. 
So I think that's all my, my Selassia slides. So why don't I stop sharing at the moment and we'll, um, we'll uh, kind of end this conversation and get into our next topic. Is that good? Yeah, ab absolutely. Just because um, I know that you've been following um, Kelly uh, Vader Austin's work and something she's been talking about quite a lot recently is how she's starting to have telepathic conversations with water, how she can simply have a thought and imprint that thought um, on her um, on, on the water before she freezes it and the thought will appear in the water. And so she's having this telepathic relationship, which really does suggest that water is this living consciousness. And therefore that really impels us to be very conscious of the quality of water we're drinking, but also that the emotions that we have in interrelating with that water. And, you know, we're just in the whole flow of water, aren't we? We ingest, we urinate it out. But, you know, the frequency yeah. of love will change the structure of the water, even if it's regular tap water. So there's something really profound and there's something also around water we know can hold information and consciousness. So how much of our consciousness oh. is actually coming from the water? It's the oh. water that holds information and memory. Don't you think water, the water can hold memory also? It, I think some German scientists have proved that. Oh. They've actually proved wow. that. So you know water may be playing a much much bigger part in our consciousness as well as our health that we're barely you know barely becoming aware of right now yes well um let me share this with you uh, am i sharing it at the moment or not <laughs> not yet but i'm sure you will Okay, well, let me do this, uh, share this because it just is exactly related to what you were saying. So, uh, are you seeing that now? Yep. yep. Okay. Beautiful. So, it's another one of my St. John photos. <laughs> and uh, um, so, this is, um, uh, I, I saw a beautiful video uh, discussion with this Hopi elder, uh, Vernon Mase, um, Maseo. Masayevska, Ma, yeah, so it's on YouTube, I'm giving the link here, and I've only taken a part of what he was saying from his Hopi teachings. We are not separated. We are connected to every living thing, not just here on the planet, the earthly planet, but down at the bottom of the oceans and the upper world, the cosmos sea, the home of the cloud people. That's where you go when your physical body dies here on earth. Then the liquid inside your body evaporates and it joins, ascends to the cloud people. And there we rest and we come back as rain, as snow, bringing water to nature. We replenish the lakes, the aquifers. We're on our journey back home to the sea. Water is one element that's indestructible. It cannot be destroyed. It is a living spirit. It is our connection to the creator, the great spirit. Wow, that is a, a that is absolutely beautiful. Again, this, you know, this flow of life, which is so wonderful. And um, from what you're saying as well, um, Kelly, and this came up in the in the conversation with Magenta, because Magenta had channeled about water in space. And, and mermaids. Yes, and the Bible talks about the waters below and the waters above. Yes, because oh, the, yeah. this person yesterday, this follower of mine, and, and and I'm not quite sure of the source of it, but she says water molecules form in interstellar space by chemical reactions between hydrogen and oxygen molecules, such as carbon monoxide. The solar system inherited its waters from ice-coated interstellar grains in the dust clouds. Oh. which the sun and planets formed 4.6 billion, billion years ago. Oh. So this There's is the ancientness of, right? The salt and the water. 
Wow, that's that's extraordinary. You know, I love seeing you in Magenta Pixie. Um, yeah, because I followed you both for a long time. And yeah, you know, she did a follow up video that amplified some of that information that you were discussing. Fascinating, yeah. wonderful. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah, the mermaids. <laughs> we're but all mermaids in a way, right? Is it absolutely? And isn't it interesting that water, as you say, has that ancientness? Yes. So it's carrying all the ancient wisdom of our entire history, billions of years into today. And it kind of, this kind of makes me think about Sedna because mm. she is so ancient and primitive and has such a long 11,000 yes. year orbit. There's something very ancient um, with those sea creatures that, that she birthed from her mm -hmm. fingers. And th th there's some connection there to the water's wisdom and living consciousness that can actively teach us something mm. that I don't think we've 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 clocked yet. That we fully, you know, we're 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 kind of in the very early stages. You, am I making sense, Kelly? Oh, I yes, yes. And <laughs> and Sen is so deep, and and like her, or she's so far out. <laughs> yeah, know? like literally. Uh, and and her orbit, I don't think her orbit's still exactly determined. I don't quite know, but I do know that it's uh, really far out beyond the Kuiper belt, far beyond the Kuiper belt, and that she is at this point is coming closer and closer to us. Yeah, I think within the next 50 years, she's going to be at her closest point to the Earth, which is... Well, yeah, I, I didn't. Um, yeah, you were talking about that with Jennifer Gale. I love that talk, too. Um, so I, I've got a couple of Sedna slides. Um, let me bring those up. Um, sharing screen again. <laughs> so um, it's an Inuit um, uh, goddess, an Inuit archetype. Um, named because, you know, the Arctic Sea is like way out there in the dark, cold area, like Sedna is in space. So uh, I like to honor the culture as much as possible when I'm engaging with these uh, uh, these uh, Kuiper Belt objects and two Inuit artist versions of, um, of Sedna. And I love the one that makes her a mermaid. I mean, she's a sea creature herself. So all the sea creatures embody Sedna. Sedna is the sea creatures. And some of these, as you said, are very, very old creatures. Yeah. So the energy the, and deep in the sea, deep in the sea. You know, so I watched a documentary a while ago and it was about that, you know, at the bottom of the sea, which is one of our realms still to discover, you know, that that there's um, places that where heat comes from under the the water, heat comes up and life forms can emerge from the deepest part of the sea where this heat comes up. Wow, from the molten core of the earth. Yeah. Say that again. From the molten core of the earth. Something like that. Yes, the heat that's, you know, happening down there, whatever is happening down there, you know, is very complex and life forming. And so we've got, you know, the sunlight on the dancing on the top of the sea, but also the when you have, say, like, I think the Mediterranean is as as translucent as the Caribbean in a turquoise way, you can also see the light patterning at uh, on the sand at the bottom of the of shallow water and that too and it's like wave patterns that are you, you can just imagine that the universe is made of of such wave patterns that you see the the water's movement you know kind of on the bottom of the sea so that too seems to me to be a bit of Selassia there but this is a deep dark sea when we're talking Sedna. And there are mystery creatures down there, like, right, we hear about the giant squid and, you know, all kinds of stuff down there. Like, you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe there's some kind of creatures that 
do live down there. Like um, there's a very large, it's called an oarfish and it's yards long. It's, it's very big. And when they, they live down really deep in the sea and when they sense that an earthquake is coming and they can do that from the vibration, even at the bottom, like near the bottom of the sea where they are, they can feel the vibration and they will surface. And so they're known, like in Japan, I think it is, as the um, foreteller of a her of an earthquake about to happen. Wow! So extraordinary sure. intelligence as well. Yes, yes, and, and a different level of sensitivity, you know, and and you know the way they feel the vibrations of the water, and like you said, the whales and dolphins singing create light in the water. That is just just spectacular and i think we're gonna as you say kelly discover so much about healing and regenerative um, um abilities from these very deep sea creatures apparently there's a particular jellyfish a little bit like a salamander who can regenerate itself and um you can certainly now get kind of little elixirs using um uh, you know, so I don't know how they've done it sort of homeopathically or whatever that echo the regenerative properties of this jellyfish and it's used for rejuvenation. Whoa. Oh, and I, I should have mentioned too. Oh, I love that. Really do love that. And I want to tell you that there's um, when I was researching Selassie, I forgot to mention this. There's a a plant native to India and Sri Lanka that is used in Ayurvedic healing. And it's called Salacia. <laughs> Salacia reticulata and Salacia oblonga have healing properties that prevent the sugars from getting into the bloodstream. So it's good for diabetes. And that that intrigued me because, you know, sweet and salty, you know, they're like two different things. So Selassie, doesn't the sugar come in, but she's all about the salt. That is fascinating because diabetes is such a massive, massive problem, isn't it, across the world? And Asian people particularly are genetically predisposed to it. So, you know, if we can prevent it with something as simple as salt, I mean, that is just revolutionary. It's so yeah. cheap. Wow. Well, this, this is a plant and, and they use the roots and the stems and, and they can carve cups out of the, the wood. And if you drink liquids out of um, things made from the Selassia plant, even that helps you know, with, the, with the sugar balance in your body and can help with other things as well. Um, so that this is, you know, there's not a lot of information, but it is a traditional Ayurvedic, um, uh, um, medicine. That's absolutely fascinating. I wasn't aware of that. Boy, so, that's so the, much in salt. Yeah, yeah, we want the salt. So, um, uh, you know, when Salas, when Sedna was first um, discovered in 2003, um, with you know her orbit, there there are estimates anywhere from ten thousand out to fourteen thousand years, and um, she she is way out there. Here's um, a brief summary of her movement, and it comes she comes closer and closer to us at this point, and I have written down that her perihelion is at in twenty seventy six. Okay. Now I I meant to uh, refer to Alan Clay's really huge book on Sedna. Um, he gives a lot of data and uh, a lot of you know initial <coughs> interpretation. Um, but Sedna, so Sedna was in Aries um, actually from 1867 to 19. 65 to 68 in her transitional uh, time. So that's about, you know, a hundred years. And she'll be, um, she's in Taurus. She has been in Taurus since 65 to 68 uh, until this year and next year she's changing sign. 
So that's um, that's only 55 years or so. And she's in Gemini until 2065 to 67. So that's somewhere a little more than 30 years. So this is, um, I guess she is at her perihelion in Cancer. Yeah. Uh, and that is perhaps, you know, it's 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 a very short orbital time also. And then, you know, so she's in Gemini for, say, 30 years. When she's opposite in Sagittarius, she's way out there. Yeah. And that must be taking like a thousand or more years. And she goes right out to the edge of the Oort cloud, doesn't she? Almost collect, uh, connecting with other galaxies, I would think, at that, at that oh, point. And yeah. bringing about new information from far oh. galaxies. Yeah. Well, you know, I first heard about Sedna when I was living in the Virgin Islands because they had this uh, television series for Christmas. And I have never seen the whole series, but part of it had to do with these, these elves uh, who were in the Virgin Islands, and they had to go uh, to the North Pole to find Santa Claus uh, for some reason. So they went up to find Santa Claus, and they were there where the Inuit people live. And there, there, there had to be um, a ritual done uh, by a shaman who took this ivory comb, traveled in his shamanic body down to the bottom of the sea to find Sedna, and he used that comb to help comb her matted hair, which was all tangled up with seaweed. And she so appreciated that and being honored anyway, that she allowed the people to have some of her sea creatures for food and also all the other uses for things like walruses and seals and you know um, all those Northern sea creatures. So, that was my first hearing of, of Sedna. And it's so. going to be really fascinating, isn't it, when she, when she conjuncts Uranus in May 2026, because that's going to be in Gemini. Yes. And that's really soon. It, it absolutely is. <laughs> yes. And, and that's, that feels to me like a whole other level of consciousness. I, well, yes, it's one of the stepping stones, but you know, what a time, as you were saying earlier, all these, so many things are changing sign yeah. and Sedna's at her perihelion yeah. closer to us, you know, bringing her message right close. So one um, of the first Sedna researchers was my friend, Barbara Shermer, yeah. who passed away a few years ago. But she did some early writing uh, about Sedna uh, and has said that Sedna represents a new and powerful voice calling us to a balanced and sustainable relationship with nature. And I love that. The Australian astrologer Alan Clay, you know, wrote this huge volume with all kinds of information and suggested interpretations. And um, during her research, um, Barbara had a dream in which she was being pulled down by a whirlpool in the water. And that dream ended up being an auger of her cancer um, uh, uh, diagnosis. And so she worked with Sedna uh, and also with very powerful Tibetan chanting through her, um, you know, kind of uh, uh, a cancer curing or uh, alleviating anyway. And she wrote a monologue from the voice of Sedna, uh, which I can't find, um, but uh, it was performed at uh, one of the major astrology conferences. And here is a picture from that performance. Oh, wow. So and she was talking about her story. She was talking about, um, you know, the myth. She was speaking in her own voice about her pain and about, um, you know, her her renewal and her power. 
and speaking for the earth and the ecology of the water and of earth itself. And isn't it, I mean, that was a beautiful quote of hers that you just shared, Kelly. And isn't it interesting that so many of these Kuiper Belt objects are, 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 they're all really calling us back to this balance and sustain, sustainable relationship with nature. You know, if you look at, if you look at the, the Homer, um, she's very much echoing that that archetype as well. Um, and I think even Algira and Heron Hayawako, they're very much talking about this this kind of Lemurian concept. Oh yeah, living in harmony, living in alignment. We are all one with nature. We're not not just exploiting and pillaging. We are. We coming... share the waters. We yeah. share the waters. Not to mention the air and the earth and the and the sunlight, the fire, but. You know, uh, and I think these are on a very subtle realm of the etheric realm, which is the fifth element in many philosophies. And in in, in Buddhist philosophy, they talk about uh, physical ether and non-physical ether. So I think these Kuiper Belt objects are work on that, you know, liminal arena where there's, you know, we can sense something in another, in, in the higher unseen realm and if we focus on that, use our attention and intention for the good of all, we can bring that in to our reality. We can make it into our physicality. And that's these creator gods, that's what they do. Yeah. And so, you know, Sedna is, is about renewal and regeneration, uh, creating creatures. And so if she's coming closer to the earth and the sun, than she's been in however many thousand years, you said earlier, you know, some new creatures are going to reappear and some will, will be formed, you know, new creatures. Some, so it might be time for certain creatures to, to leave the earth energy field and new creatures to come in. And so this of Sedna might be part of that, the indication of that too. So isn't this in all of this is saying, you know, so many factors with astrology are talking about this, this new octave of consciousness, this evolution of consciousness, this jump so that we become kind of new humans and, 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 and new life forms in the most natural organic sense. I, I adore this Hopi message. I mean, I, I just think I, I, I'll put that underneath the video, in fact, Kelly, because I, I just think that's so perfect to to remind us it's very it's very necessary humbling to remind us we are just part of the flow of nature and the flow of water and, and the importance of keeping ourselves in a very positive state of love because mm -hmm. it affects the water so dramatically. Mm -hmm. You know, when we die, you know, it's dust to dust, right? So what remains is those tissue cell salts that are the, the primary building blocks and the water in our body evaporates. That is that is such a stunning idea to me. Yeah, it is. It is beautifully humbling that we, you know, we we just kind of dive back into the earth and and the seas and then reemerge again in a different form in a new lifetime. But we carry. Yeah. It's something about just carrying the flow on. It's almost like the the nodal axis in a way. That infinity symbol of of, of there's just a constancy of bringing back the wisdom, which we're seeing very much in all that you've talked about today, but we are embodying it in our physicality with each new lifetime. Oh, yes, yes. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Kelly, any, this has been so rich. I mean, I've absolutely loved it. I just feel we're on such a, a journey here of exploration that is just, we're just really, because, Celassia has only been recently discovered and, and really so is Sedna too. So we're just we're just at the beginning of this journey, which feels which feels immense. It, the journey in itself feels like an evolutionary leap in what we're going to discover. It's a change of consciousness, you yeah. know, and it is that kind of quantum field where everything is interconnected. <laughs> and these are teaching us that even in a literal way through the, the fluid light, through the the uh, embodiment of, um, you know, that sustain the water that's and salt that sustains our bodies. Mm -hmm. And um, this is, and the more pure we get, 
the the higher perhaps our consciousness can reach or the finer vibrations it can bring in. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a vital part. And if you're not well hydrated, you, you can't bring that kind of clean aura. I mean, one of the things apparently, and it may be true, the wonderful places you've talked about in the Virgin Islands and, and you know, Salt Lake City, et cetera, is the salt apparently, it said, helps to also cleanse your aura. Oh, I like that. Yeah, yeah, aura yeah. as well as your yeah. as, as your physical being as well. So there's something incredibly precious in 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 humble, inexpensive salt. Not table salt, not no. Morton salt, no. But the the you know salt that is evaporated from the sea or that is in these dried up salt ponds or or you know the, the good stuff. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, um, yeah, years ago, I had a client who was having a terrible problem with dehydration and she was drinking lots of water. And I sent her to a practitioner who, you know, muscle tested and I'm not quite sure how he helped her, but he did. But I got to thinking about that and thinking that she must have been lacking salt so yep. that the, the water was not being absorbed by her body yeah because apparently it, it feels very counterintuitive and paradoxical but you've got to take in enough salt to retain the water in your body otherwise it goes straight through so you know it that kind of feels odd but apparently that's you uh -huh. know that's correct medically so well in the winter up here in the north where i am now in vermont people put out salt licks for the deer yes and other animals that that like that because you know it's hard to find water unless you're gonna like eat a lot of snow so. yeah. <laughs> and you can very easily get this this natural gray salt there's there's the celtic sea salt um you can get camargue salt from the south of france they have these big sort of salt pans and they do it in a very traditional way and clearly you've got something similar in your your part of the woods too and it's so you can feel it doing you good um utterly different from table salt that you know has been promoted so mm -hmm. this is i love this kelly um is there anything else you'd like to to say before we complete today oh it's just i just love this new <laughs> saturn in pisces um although you know well we're gonna need that fluidity you know and a little like uh mm, you know like uh Sure, like the shoreline with the sea so we don't flood all around and get really and also so if this is structured it's helping us contain our own energetic structure which is really important so that we aren't so absorbent to all of the neg negative energies around we want to really keep our own field as clear as possible yeah, absolutely. And I also see it as a sort of more dedicated spiritual practice uh -huh. and spiritual mastery, perhaps spiritual integrity, all of these things. It, it really is emphasizing with being co-present with Neptune now in Pisces, um, the importance uh -huh. of spirituality in our lives yeah. and uh, being That's a sun and moon Pisces. I'm going to be hit pretty <laughs> <laughs> between the eyes. With them. I'm a double Pisces progressed. Yes, <laughs> yes. Like, oh, I just yes, became that a couple of months ago. And, you know, in honor of Saturn going into Pisces, I posted on my website and it comes out in my newsletter too, which is a free subscription if you want, um, the story of the little sea maid by Hans Christian Andersen. Yeah. And um, his story was not the same as the Disney movie by any means. That her quest was indeed a spiritual quest. Not only not she was not only interested in marrying the prince for romance, uh, but because if a mermaid marries a human, she can say, uh, share in the soul that humans have, and she wanted a soul. So it's a really beautiful story, and I put that um, you know on my website. Um, which I'm sure you will link below as you so often do. And 
I am just, you know, so delighted that you're as interested in the Kuiper Belt objects, these new, like, amazing uh, archetypes awakening or reawakening, you know, in our experience, um, you know, as I am. So I, I just delight in in these discussions with you where we we really uh, come up with some new thoughts and and share so much that we've both been looking into well it was you who absolutely electrified me as i say kelly and you've done so much you know really pioneering work pioneering research into them and they they feel magical they shift oh. us into the quantum they shift us out of this this 3d density linear time into something much more magical much more um where we have an ability to shape shift to manifest um and to flow with all of life and people love it i know when we discuss them um people absolutely you know can see a much more exciting future rather than looking at the destiny and you know the density and the rubble and the chaos they're looking out to something magical and beautiful so yeah. thank you for all that you've done to contribute to this whole new area of astrology because because you really have um done some extraordinary work and, and continue to do so with all the new discoveries that you're making wow. so so bless you bless you bless you and thank you so much and for all your time all your dedication as well it's so much appreciated likewise <laughs> okay take care so bye everyone lots of love lots of love to kelly lots of love to everyone thank you bye-bye